great turnout. Yes. <laughs> There's a big meeting for a design bridge, so that might be why. Ah. That's where I was headed, and then I detoured. <laughs> yeah, it's a meeting I should, I'm supposed to be at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You want me to just go get them and bring them in here for yeah. you, They can interrupt your life. Uh, over there. Yeah. <laughs> Who is that in there is talking, speaking? Caitlin? Who is it? Caitlin Gilman. Oh, hey, Caitlin. Can you see on camera or no? I don't think there's. Yeah, I think the can. Yeah. Yes, I can see so. you. <laughs> when he's at the podium, he can't see you. Okay, good. But they can adjust it so you can But see I'm not going to stand behind this podium. I can't stand behind this podium. Where do you go? No, we need to the right of our shop. Right of our shop is not in this room. Did you go to the lecture? It was in 279 last time. Okay. Can you go? Yep. Yeah? My mic's not on. I'm just talking to people as they come to the door. I all seem to want a rabbit workshop. Nobody seems to care about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> Good. Do they help you uh, plug in? Oh, yeah. We're all set up. On so you're all, <laughs> you're all <laughs> Is this being uh, yes. sound PC? Oh, okay. Hey, Chris, you there? Yes, Nico. Are, are, am I going to have this, my, the two screens up while I uh, give this lecture? Okay, so. I, I'd rather not just so I can, I'd rather do that, yes, while I speak. <laughs> good? Yes, yeah, so you don't want them to see you while you talk? <laughs> uh, I don't mind if they see me or not, but like when I'm, uh, when I'm doing the, talking about the slides. Right now, it kind of cuts off the slides and makes it a funny proportion. So I'd rather, like, while the lecture's going on, and then maybe question and answer, we can bring you guys back in. Does that sound good? That's fine for me. I, I'm sure your three customers over here would be utterly disappointed if they could well, Even better, see. that way you can just turn them off and I'll think that there's millions. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to the rabbit thing. Yeah, so that, you know, that question is for Sean. Sean has control of what you see. Yeah, I'll change that when the when you start.
Not really. Is there a remote? Or not? Gene, and uh, he is also co-director of the Sustainable Cities Initiative, which he'll talk a little bit about, so I won't describe it 
Um, Nico started out uh, with a degree in cognitive psychology from uh, Cornell, then went on to do his Bachelor of Architecture at Cornell, then Masters of Architecture and Masters of Urban Planning at uh, UC Berkeley. So he's full of education. Uh, after that, he worked uh, with uh, William Ron Associates, very well known and good firm in Boston, and then came to uh, the University of Oregon in 2005 to join our faculty. I'm not sure how you moved from Boston to Eugene, but uh, he did, and uh, has been on our faculty since. And his, his uh, interests have focused on urbanism, especially uh, edge city and peripheral city development, and uh, in sustainability and how it interacts with uh, issues of urbanism. And uh, that all came together nicely in his uh, co-founding of the Sustainable Cities Initiative uh, this year, which is focusing on Gresham. And some of you, have, I know, have already worked on that uh, project. So, uh, and Nico has been active in grant, uh, in securing some excellent grants for the school, especially through the uh, Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, it's called. So, uh, anyway, without further uh, delay, I'd like to turn this over to Nico. Can everyone hear me? It's on the Okay, great. Um, so thanks, Jerry, for the introduction. Uh, so I am, as Jerry said, I uh, uh, teach up in Eugene. For those many uh, familiar faces that I have seen up there, and for those of you who haven't been uh, you in Eugene. Down. down in Eugene, sorry. Sorry, I'm from, I'm from Argentina, <laughs> so my whole world is upside down. Uh, <laughs> my wife always gets on my track for that. Um, so, uh, so I teach down in Eugene. Um, and I'm also, as Jerry mentioned, the, one of the co-directors of the Sustainable Cities Initiative. The Sustainable Cities Initiative is a combination of architects, landscape architects, planners, people in law, in business, geography, environmental studies, uh, journalism that um, works on issues of sustainability as it relates to the built environment, so stuff that we are well immersed in. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do, uh, we have kind of a research piece, we have kind of a, a policy piece of trying to affect legislation. And one of the things that uh, I'm, many of you have actually participated in, there's a couple studios up in Portland and a class up in Portland that uh, has been working on this is the Sustainable City mm -hmm. Year, which is that each year we partner with a specific city and help them with their um, sustainability projects and agenda. This year, our first year, we're doing uh, Gresham. And we've had a number of projects, both in Eugene and in uh, uh, Portland, working on those things. It's been tremendously successful, great opportunity for uh, students to uh, work with real projects, real time, real politics, real economics, and real design issues, uh, which has been really, really fantastic. So we're going to be doing that again next year. Um, we're selecting cities in the next couple uh, weeks, actually. So look out for that. Uh, there should also be more courses in the spring term uh, for sustainable city. But today, I want to talk about fringe urbanism, which is uh, really thinking about how sustainability can happen in the suburbs. Um, and so we'll go through all this. Thanks all for everyone for coming. So if we think about it, uh, historically, there's been like this contrast, this, this, this opposing piece between uh, what the city is, which is frenetic and busy and full and lots of interactions, diversity um, uh, um, kind of happening, versus the, the uh, idyllic, idyllic image of the suburbs. In this case, this is Letchworth, which is one of the first kind of suburbs, uh, tr uh, what we kind of think of as traditional suburbs in England which was pastoral, quiet, uh, um, really integrated with nature, separated from the city. You had these kind of windings, which really took you away from everything that was urban. So these really kind of diametrically opposed things. In this country, um, that really took off, although it existed in much earlier examples uh, within the country, uh, Riverside and such, uh, as Levittown took off um, in the 50s, the suburbs the way that we kind of think of them right now and in, in it seems to be in all pop culture and and uh, and uh, the literature and all this is kind of this right the single family home the nuclear family a certain kind of uh, demographic uh, economic class uh, social kind of structure that happens with that this form issue of these these 
loops and lollipops, right, the, the cul-de-sac. And so, like, the idea of urbanism uh, could never happen in the suburbs. Because, you know, there, there's been recently, as I'm sure you all know, this idea of uh, new urbanism has, has caught on of the idea of bringing urbanism to the suburbs. And there's all these, you know, large master plan communities that have been developed around the country, which bring all this density and kind of uh, one large kind of move of creating um, uh, these mini cities, we'll say, mini urban areas within uh, the suburbs. And the argument for doing this is on the one hand, you know, that the ur urbanism's now kind of gone up in, in value uh, around the country, uh, as opposed to, you know, that before it was this nasty, horrible, crime-infested thing, but now there's all these benefits that we can think of with urbanism. But the, we can't really do urbanism in uh, suburbs, the arguments go, because there's no density in suburbs, there's no diversity in suburbs, <laughs> And uh, there's no proximity in the suburbs. There's nothing that you can go to nearby. So all of a sudden, that kills everything that you can do uh, for urbanism. And I'm kind of here to argue that that's not really the case, and we should really relook at some of those things. There is a lot of density in suburbia. And it's this, and I, I cringe at showing this to a bunch of architecture students, but this stuff exists all over the place. Right? This is suburban multifamily housing. Uh, it's, there's 9 million units of it in the United States. One in four units of housing in the suburbs in this country is this stuff, right? So when you think of suburbs and you think of the idyllic single-family home and all that, that's great, but that's, that's, you're missing one in four units of housing in the suburbs. It's typically quarries, as you can see here. This one here is uh, assisted living, so it goes up higher. Once you get elevators in there, you can go a little bit higher. Typically, the circulation is outside of the building, surrounded by seas of parking, lots and lots and lots of parking. Uh, sometimes around these kind of uh, courts with amenities. Oftentimes they have um, um, clubhouses and, you know, maybe a little uh, basketball court. I've seen some with racquetball courts inside of them. Um, uh, planned kind of activities. Right? Maybe some of the students don't know this stuff yet, but this is what a lot of people graduate and then go live in. Right? So it's a lot of like post, the first, first move out into the suburbs type uh, housing. And, and why are people going there? Well, because they either don't want to, they don't have the money for a single family home, which is sometimes the case, but not always the case. They don't want it to be stuck within a single family home. That's a lot of capital you're putting in, and you're not as mobile as you would like to be. They don't have to deal with the upkeep of a single family home. So people are moving to the suburbs, not necessarily for the idyllic cup of sugar next door type thing, which is what you know, we typically have thought of as suburbia, but instead that most of the jobs are actually now in the suburbs. So a lot of people go out there for that reason. But there's this whole demographic that isn't really part of the single family home kind of lifestyle, your thought will say, right? And so they're moving into these types of things. This is what it looks like, typical stuff in plan. So you can see lots and lots and lots of parking all around. This, usually this strange, looks like someone like rolled and threw these things out on the ground of these buildings that are all kind of uh, uh, scattered. Uh, they usually try to center it around some kind of, at least one larger green space which has a pool or some kind of amenity, clubhouse. And then they have these limited connections to arterials, which are here, right, larger roads. I'll show you some images later on. And no connection to anything around it. So if we think about uh, the way that, that we've thought about suburbs in this country, uh, you know, up until about 1980, or mid-1980s, everyone thought the suburbs were just this housing thing that was going on. And then, uh, you know, Joel Garot came out with this idea of edge cities, and there's, oh my goodness, there's all these other things that are going out on out in the suburbs, and there's all this, you know, um, malls are going on out there, office parks, uh, all this other kind of pieces. There's commerce going on, there's, there's uh, uh, research, all these things that are happening out there. And what's interesting is in, in the, the, the uh, concept of Edge City, this tome that Joel Rowe wrote about uh, the, the kind of this new face of suburbia, what's absolutely missing is this idea of this dense housing that exists out there. Tyson's Corner was his um, prototypic um, um, edge city, and what's strange is that he missed all that. All that is dense multifamily <laughs> housing. We're talking densities of 20 <laughs> an acre. San Francisco, I think, is 34. Jerry, you can check me on that. 34 units an acre in uh, for San Francisco. So these things are being built at densities as dense as like, right? But so. We have density, right? Density exists out there. 
It's, uh, this, it's also the fastest growing housing market in the country since 1970. So I apologize, these grays are kind of washed out with the, on this thing. But this is multi suburban multifamily housing. This is suburban single family housing. So it's a huge growing sector. I mean, all over the country, it kind of makes sense. It's a demographic shifting. This is a, a housing type that's taking over. Now, who lives there? All right, so we have density. Is there, is there diversity out there? If we want to think about how urbanism might happen out there, is there diversity happening out there? This is what we typically think of, of suburbia, right? That seems to be like Im, Im, imprinted in everyone's mind about what the suburbs are about. Well, suburbs are actually much different than that. And so this is actually a, a photograph from 1970, right? The, the, um, uh, Bill Owen did this photo essay on um, uh, suburban households. You know, just looking at a couple areas in California, what he finds there's, you know, suddenly if you start looking around, there's tremendous diversity that happens in suburbia. And in fact, if you look at the statistics that have happened, you know, been gathered since the 1970s when the, the census changed, there's a tremendous amount of diversity that's happened in suburbia. There's a lot of single people, uh, so diversity being ethnic and racial, right, but also in, in um, a family structure, right, and most of that stuff is actually happening within su suburban multifamily housing. So I'm, I'll, I'll warn, uh, uh, this being an architecture lecture, that there's going to be a couple graphs, right? And there's even one of them shows like statistical significance. Um, but so this is showing the, the orange is uh, suburban uh, multifamily housing. The gray is single family housing. And these are household types as defined by the census. Uh, married, married with children. This is conveniently called non-families. <laughs> In other words, singles or, and roommates or uh, uh, same-sex couples. Um, and non-family with kids. And what you see is the gray stuff looks like what we typically think of as suburbia, mostly married with kids. And what most of the people who live in the suburban multifamily housing are actually this non-family, right? They're uh, people who are divorced, people who are um, widowed, people who are single, roommates, all kinds of uh, arrangements that are not your, what you typically considered uh, a suburban demographic. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity that's happening out there. It's not simply the, the, the nuclear family. And kind of attached with that is this idea that this is also a demographic that might actually be more interested in urbanism than suburbanism, right? Than the, the quiet kind of uh, uh, coffee and, and cup of sugar type thing, right? This is a, a, a much younger demographic typically or a demographic that doesn't have an internal structure within the home, a social structure within the home typically. So there's, there's a whole kind of op opportunity that exists out there. So whereas, and I'm, I'm sorry this is kind of washed out here, but if we think of this as typical, these are actually proportion the sizes in proportion to the um, percentage of that demographic with, within single family homes, right? Here it is for multifamily homes, right? So it's a, it really changes the landscape of what suburbia is. So we have density, we have diversity, and now the question is, is there proximity? Do we have the possibility that things are dense and actually close enough together that we can start getting a little bit of synergy happening and, and uh, start making a little bit of buzz, which is like this, what I would call a semi-urban condition? Well, it just so happens that these 9 million units that are around the country are almost always located right next to commercial areas, otherwise known as strip malls, right? So all over the country, there's a strip mall, and then right outside the strip mall, and now hopefully all, you all drive through the suburbs and start noticing these things, there's dense multifamily housing. And the reason being is, you know, the, the, you, I've interviewed planners around the country about this, and they say, well, it's planning 101. You put the density right next to the commercial stuff. One reason. <laughs> Second reason is single family homes typically don't like to be right next to strip malls. And so therefore, we use multifamily housing as buffers. Because it's rental property, it's a little bit, uh, there's, there's, they're more accepting. That, that market's more accepting of living next to uh, strip malls. And so therefore, it's kind of used as a buffer. So here it is around the country. The red stuff is commercial. The kind of yellow orange stuff in this is multifamily house. You can see it's often as a buffer between the commercial stuff and the single family home. Right? So we have density, you know, up to 30 units an acre. We have diversity, uh, uh, both ethnically, racially, um, uh, in terms of a, a family type, and also a, a, a kind of social structure that would, you would think would want outside kind of influences and not simply being within the side, inside the home. And we've got proximity, right? So we have all ingredients of urbanism existing out there in suburbia without the need for master planned, you know, new urbanist type developments. 
we have all this stuff here. So why isn't urban, urbanism happening? And it's because of this, which is that it exists in suburbia, and suburbia has a culture of being developed as enclaved, separated pieces that don't relate to each other. Right? So this is actually in Florida. There's a, actually a development called Enclave, which I thought was really, really funny. Right? But what that results in is developments like this. So this is multifamily housing from all over the country. And if you look, here's, the, as I mentioned, that kind of smattering of buildings that don't relate to each other one way or another. They often don't even relate to the topography or to natural features. And they have typically, these two being nice exceptions where they have more than one connection, but typically they have one or two connections to the rest of the world. Right? That's all to so the arterial. That's it. And so, and I don't know if you can make it out, but there's this dotted line that goes out here. Right? Those are the property lines. And there's no connections across property lines. So what you get is all this potential right, to make these connections, to have like, uh, some kind of interaction happening. And instead, you have everyone using this, right, which is this nice mobile private space that we can take anywhere we want and avoids interaction with anything around us. And so the, the, the site design of these areas has really like, limited any kind of urbanism that we might have happening. You know, with all the ingredients there, limits the amount of urbanism that could, we can have happening in suburban areas. So you have conditions like this. This is in Phoenix. These are actually, I did this a study uh, about a, a year and a half ago, looking around the country at different developments around the country. Find the same thing all over the place. This is a multifamily housing development here. There's a whole bunch of commercial happening right there. Single family home above, typical, typical pattern. And what happens? I live here, and I want to go there, right? That distance is completely walkable. Should be able to do it, no problem, right? But instead, <coughs> big wall against it, and I can't get through there. And so what I have to do is I have to walk through all this, which may or may not have sidewalks, which may or may not be interesting or, or amenable for uh, pedestrians, along an arterial, which may or may not have sidewalks and has speeding cars in it, crossing a bunch of like uh, curb cuts, along this arterial, again, may or may not have sidewalks, until I finally get here, and then there's actually no way for me to go from here to the building without crossing you know, a bunch of cars. And so what does any rational human being do? They get in their car. Right? I mean, this is like, an, uh, it becomes a much longer distance than I'd want to walk anyway. I feel like ridiculous for having to walk that far for something that should be that long. And it's in a really hostile environment. So what happens? There's a, there's a lot of driving that happens. Uh, this is another example as well here. You see, I mean, typical, look at all this commercial development that happens here. We could have walking and biking happen here. Uh, some active travel. Instead, what you have is everyone gets in their car and drives from one place to another. <coughs> So um, this is a, a description of what some of those edge conditions are like, right? These kind of large blank walls. This is actually developments that are looking out onto commercial development. Same kind of thing happening up there. This is edge conditions. These are horrible, horrible environments. Here we have all the ingredients, you know, the, all the arguments for why suburbs can't have any kind of urban kind of spark to them. The ingredients are all there. It's all design, right? Which is, puts it in the hands of everyone in this room. Uh, typical examples of, you know, not not thinking that people walk, so why bother? So I have done these interviews all over the country with planners, architects, and developers, asking them kind of in a very nice way, why do you design like this? And the answer over and over and over again, it's, it's suburbia, no one walks. No one walks, don't worry about it. Like, you know, uh, maybe we had someone on staff who really like is crazy about sidewalks and you know, they're like the like planner activist type, so we put sidewalks in, but you can tell how much care they put into their sidewalks which is they just end it and don't make a connection to a commercial area that's right there. In other words, they're not taking into account any pedestrians. So the question is, do people walk? So we did a study in, in Eugene, um, kind of mimicked the study that we did nationally, but this time we really zeroed in on more connected and less connected developments. So more connected developments, this is Heron Meadows. Has, I'm not sure how much of this you can make up. Lots of pedestrian paths. There's a road that comes through here and connects through here. There's connections directly to the commercial area right there, right? And there's actually three of them through there. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to walk. And this is not rocket science. It's not actually even all that attractive. <laughs> it's <laughs> attractive than the stuff that's out there. I wouldn't call it like, like fantastic design. But it makes those connections, right? And so as opposed to things like this, which don't have sidewalks, don't have any connections at all, you know, to, from, to go from here to the strip mall that's right there, you have to go up and around and through, and which means you don't do it. And so we, um, so we, we asked a bunch of questions as far as, uh, or we looked at the, these differences between connected and less connected, you know, typical kind of conditions here. 
uh, these, this direct connection to the strip mall versus what you typically get is these walls. And these are the last two graphs, I promise. This is, the, this is what we ended up finding. Right? So the orange is the more connected developments, and the gray is the less connected developments. And what we saw is that, <laughs> pretty straightforward, if you're in places that are not very amenable to, to uh, uh, walking and biking, you have a ton more driving right? of, the t of the number of trips. And if you're in a place that has, it is more amenable, you have almost twice as much walking. Now, this, this is the total number of trips. Now, something to think about here is, in a place where everyone says no one walks, even in these nasty developments that aren't really well connected, we have a fifth of the trips are happening walking and biking. So there is a pedestrian culture out there. I mean, there is, which, as far as anyone who's interested in urbanism, this should be like a, a huge kind of like a foothold, right? And then the second part is, ah, if you do a little bit of nice design, all of a sudden you double that, right? 40% of the, 43% of the trips are actually walking and biking. This is actually looking at individuals, so that's all the trips. This is how many people are actually doing that, right? Because it could be just one person is doing a ton of walking. We saw you know, in, in well-connected developments, almost three-quarters of the people are walking every once in a while, at least once a week, sorry, that was our question, uh, to the local commercial area, to the strip mall nearby, right? Um, walking or biking only, you know, twice as many, 20%. Any trip that they make is, is walking or biking to their local commercial area. Right? I mean, this is like kind of crazy for suburbia. No one walks in suburbia. Well, actually, there's a tremendous amount of this walking and biking that happens. So, all that to set up the question of, so what do we do? Right? We're designers. Uh, if you're interested in urbanism, if you're interested in kind of thinking of different ways of, of making the, the suburbs develop, on the one hand, there's the kind of the master plan approach that I talked about before with the new urbanism. On the other hand, there's uh, looking at this. this is, there's a huge opportunity in here with all these ingredients sitting out there how can we make more of a difference in how, how to make the designs more connected and create and so create a bunch of things. On the one hand, this kind of semi-urban condition, which I think is one of the things I'm most interested in. On the other hand, from an environmental standpoint, that much less car use, right? That much less traffic, that much less carbon emissions, right? From a health standpoint, that many more people getting out and walking. Think about the amount of calories that can burn just by those little trips that happen every day and how, that, how I mean, with the obesity epidemic that's happening in this country, tremendous change just from this little bit of attention take, given to this thing. So when we think about design, what, what are the ideas that we have to think about? These are some basic things. And I'm going to show a project. Uh, so I did a, a kind of research-based studio uh, a couple terms back, a couple years back now, uh, on uh, suburban multifamily housing. I'm going to use one of, the, one of the projects to kind of illustrate some of these points. Then I'm going to show you some real projects that, that, are, that are looking at some of this. So the idea of having an urban structure, so there's actually a structure of this thing, and you don't have this kind of loopy, lobby type uh, uh, urban development plan, right? That so there's actually something that connects the areas around it. That strip synergy that you start looking at, thinking of the strip mall, not so much this horrible thing, which it's so hard to not think of it as this horrible thing, <laughs> but that there's actually, if you think about it, it's like one of the few places in the suburbs that people get out and walk. That and malls, right? That little strip of, of, of a sidewalk in front of all the stores, people actually walk on that thing. So isn't there a potential there to capitalize on that and say, ah, that could be the basis of some urbanity? Right? It's like scratching the surface there. Externalizing some amenities. The idea that if, if these developments are being created all over the country and they have these amenities which are, uh, you know, the, oftentimes they have a gym, some even have like theaters or ath uh, other athletic kind of facilities or like conference centers. I mean, they're, they, some of them get extremely elaborate. What if we externalize them and made them part of like that, a more public realm? Right? And so there could be a chance for interaction between residents and non-residents happening there. Right? It's really like kind of reconceptualizing what these areas could be. Absorbing the automobile is not having these seeds of parking. And then graduated public-private realms, which I think is the, the most important part to really creating a sense of urbanism. Because right now, the way things exist with that private mobile space, the car, you go from this private space into your private development, even if you, it's not gated private development into your private house, and there's no opportunity for interaction, which kills any opportunity for urban urbanism or urbanity. So um, this is a project done by Megan Griswold, Tracy Baskew, and Mark Griffin. We actually worked after this, uh, and I'm going to show some slides as well for, for the Metropolis um, Ideas Competition. Uh, we didn't win, but uh, I'll show you some slides that we, that we created with that. But the idea pretty much is this creating this urban structure, right? So there's instead of it being kind of, or, instead of the site plans being organized, as I'd showed you before, kind of 
this bizarre loopy lollipopy thing that is, works with the suburbs, instead really creating like an urban structure which has streets, actual streets that exist here, right? The buildings front on that. I mean, this is kind of like urbanism 101, right? And that they connect to things around it. In this case, it's an existing strip mall. This is a project we did, as I said, this <coughs> was an actual project happening in Phoenix uh, with a developer. Really, really educational. So that's one piece of it. The externalizing some of the, some of the um, amenities is really taking some of the, the we have the uh, gymnasium that's happening here. We have a daycare that's happening here. We have uh, the, the rental office. All that, instead of being internal to the whole development, gets put on the face. And now all of a sudden there's an opportunity for interaction between people who live here and people who don't live here, maybe used to live here, or maybe will live here. I mean, so you really start to create a little bit of interaction in this place that typically has none. Uh, this is some of the idea of how that structure would work for the different housing types. The idea of this kind of mixed bar, which is really more commercial than anything, but integrated with the things around it. The idea of the, the uh, kind of modulated public to private realm instead of that strict definition from one to the other that we have the public realm, which is really the strip mall. So if you think about this kind of piece is a connection to an existing strip mall all the way around. So that really can become, I mean, it can uh, eventually become more of like a, a, a street, really the idea of, of a public street. Semi-public areas happening behind this main piece, right, that commercial piece, and then shared public, shared public roads, which then go into more private backs of houses, backs of these units into the private house. So there's an opportunity for someone to walk through here and have kind of a shared public experience, right? There, again, more interaction happening, which is the key to, I think, urbanism. Um, absorbing the automobiles, instead of putting the automobile outside of everything and having these seas of parking, bringing it in to tuck under parking. So this, we got up to densities, I think, of like 22 units an acre, absolutely possible with tuck under parking um, for these units. That's one of the images that from that studio. So what would be the next steps then as we think about, and there's three things that I think would be really good to keep in mind, and hopefully what I'm trying to do is shift kind of the, the dialogue in the country, working a lot with uh, architects, planners, and developers, shift dialogue about this kind of development. The first thing is just get some architects to think about it. Right? Architects are doing these developments, but I'm going to say that a lot, and, and not 100%, but a lot of the developments are really uninspired. I mean, they really are, and, and you know, you talk to some of the developers, and, and the way that it works is you take a building, and I could have shown you plans. I've got three plans from totally different parts of the country, which are the exact same building overlaid on each other with just slight differences of where a wall is, right? And that's the mentality of how this stuff happens, and not really thinking, so it's much more kind of an economic model as opposed to thinking about how this, this really creates place, right? And in, in the case of what I'm interested in, how it might create a semi-urban condition. So this was, a, this was a, in my mind, a great breakthrough that uh, in 2005, that was you know, the first article I'd ever seen on multi suburban multifamily housing in, in uh, Arch Record. So just getting the architectural community to start thinking about these things uh, so that we don't have to have things like this, but we can start having things like this. This uh, Pew and Scarpa and uh, Will Bruder's Loma 5 project in Scottsdale, which has beautiful architecture, really, really, really nice architecture. Uh, well, good ideas about how to bring the car inside and some nice ideas about how interaction works in the street. Also looking at a variety of, of, um, of kind of uh, building models. Uh, this is, uh, the second thing is really rethinking the whole way that site, uh, the site plans work, right, and how site organization works. This is a really nice project by Studio Ma, also in Phoenix, where they had a control of this one site. This is a small strip development, strip there, strip happening over here. And instead of creating something that would have been the typical pattern, which is, you know, walls all along there, um, and really kind of internal internal enclave, they really like may urbanize the project by creating these bars that on the one hand are, are organized face the street, or organized along these internal streets, and there's connections all the way through, right, which right now are slightly limited, but the, their intention was to continue that there, and they now have control of this site, and they want to continue it all the way through. So, that, so you start to make site plans that uh, think about the pedestrian, create this urban structure, make connections between one site and another, make connections to commercial areas, and really allow that kind of opportunity for, for um, interaction to happen. Here's the project. This is the, the PRD 845 by Studio Ma. There's also fantastic, re it's really nice architecture, and it does really great things for local Phoenix architecture as far as dealing with sustainability issues and how their skin works uh, to cool the building. Right? But the main part is like the street with everything faces onto it, and on the far side, 
opening up, and this is while it was still under construction, opening up to the commercial area that's behind there, just allowing that, that porousness to exist. And some ideas about how, making, uh, how to make the buildings actually um, transition from <coughs> higher density to lower density to kind of work within. So you think about it as a continuous knit fabric of the, this housing typology within the suburbs. Uh, I would say think about it in high design, but also think about it in typical design. How is it that we can make these uh, things happen? So this is the project I showed you here in Meadows, which really does a good job, I think, of making connections. Uh, it's not what I would call a fantastically designed project, but from an urban design standpoint, it does a lot of things really well. It would be great to see more of this. Right now, we're working, um, I'm working with a couple students, and we're doing the Suburban Multifamily Site Design Handbook. And that's that's going to be a resource for planners, architects, and developers to figure out how to do these things. And it talks about you know, these really simple things that, again, urbanism 101 type things, but we need to start applying those to the suburbs and specifically to these, in what I would say is huge potential. And the last thing is really changing our mentality about how we think about the suburbs. Uh, that the suburbs are not these devoid wastelands of, of uh, suburbanness, that you know, there's no interaction that happens, there's no social life, there's no, uh, there, there, there's no like, kind of spark in there. This is, a, this is like the worst possible example. This is from one of the multifamily housing developments. They, they're, they, they sit in this funny place because they, on the one hand, they try to be this like more active, you know, trying to call for a demographic that's, that wants to get out and meet each other and do these things. And so they have these social programs and yet they still are stuck in the suburban mentality. So if you see this, this is May. And so if, best birthday wishes to our residents who celebrate their birthday this, this month, right? I mean, like it's like that <laughs> anonymous. And it, every day is breakfast, except for the 15th is tax day, and on the first rent is due. And that's the idea of like how much, what I would say, like um, urbanity happens in this area. This is a slide that we made for the, for the Metropolis competition, which really started to say, well, what if we really change the mentality of these places? So I'll read it in case you can't make it. So the top one, working where I live and spending less time on house maintenance lets me spend my evening with my family. So that's the idea of a family, a single person. Living close to my daily errands saves me money so that I can buy my neighbor a round of drinks at the bar next door. The elderly person. Downsizing my home and taking public transportation to my doctor helps me stay healthy so I can be active in what I love. And then the single parent. Telecommuting in a public place helps me to relax at work so that I can give my daughter my full attention in the evening. All these, if you remember, all these lifestyles, all these demographics, exist all over the place in, in the suburbs, in the multifamily housing, right? <laughs> what we need to do is make the link to all these things are obvious things that these lifestyles would want. And design's a big piece of making that happen. But I, think, I think as architects, there's a tremendous role that we can, we can play in this. This has not been a realm that's really been looked at. As I said, most of the time when urbanism is considered in the suburbs, it's been under the banner of new urbanism, which is, has part of a different conversation, but has its own issues. And it's also a really, really small percentage of the amount of development that happens out in suburbia. This stuff is all over the place. It's all over the place. You know, for every one master plan community, there's you know, 500 of these types of developments. And what an opportunity for us to really change the way the suburbs work. And that's it. I'm happy to take questions. So it's a good question. So I have not seen a lot of these fixed, and mostly because um, there doesn't seem to be uh, uh, that basic first step of people would actually walk here or make it, or that there, there might be interest in making a connection, right? So, but when I interviewed the architects and planners and developers throughout the country, I've asked them, you know, why don't you connect all this? You know, typically, typically the answer that I got was, which I was completely surprised about, was we didn't think about it. Honestly, we didn't think about it. So when you, if you've ever seen a, a, a submission for a, a suburban development, right? You usually have a property line, and right next door it says like C2 because that's the that's the use in that area, right? It doesn't show you what's in there, right? And this is my property, and this is what I do in this property. And honestly, it's just, I mean like this is like very Howard Davis type stuff. It's the culture of building, like it's the culture of design. That's the way it's done, right? So that the, the idea of connecting is just not something that they think of. So then I ask. Right. Would you ever connect? 
And the answer typically is, cars? No, no way. I would never put a road that would connect through there. That's, you know, people would speed through. There's going to be crime. All things mostly unfounded, and there's been a lot of research show unfounded. But okay, pedestrian connections? Sure, why not? Yeah, we just didn't think about it. You know, we didn't, or we didn't coordinate with people who were on the other side of it, right? So there's a <coughs> rule I think for architects to be kind of activists in this, or, or proponents of it, and for uh, planners to really be coordinators. Of it. Yeah, to make connections happen. And there are, and so in the developments that I've shown you where there are connections, PRD is a good example, Parent Meadows is a good example, there's others. In their marketing material, they actually talk about this great connection to the thing right next door. In Parent Meadows, when you move in, they give you coupons from this stuff right next door because you know, like the, the Burrito Amigos wants you to come over there. Right? So all, it's, it's like all the pieces are there. All the pieces are there. And I really think it's an, an awareness piece. And then let's get some good examples of design out there. Isolation kind of breeds isolation. You get comfortable with the wall, and, and that makes you comfortable. And you mentioned, uh, you know, I've never put a road through there because uh, I have fear that crime or this and that would How do you, how do you, how do we address that fear? It's a really good question. And can you repeat it for the folks? Who need to sure. Uh, so the question was um, that isolation seems to be like a comfortable kind of mode, and it's definitely a safe mode. And for people who are scared of making those connections. How do you find a way of getting over that fear, right? Um, so I don't know if there's, a, there's an easy answer to this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a whole range of answers. First of all, it's just statistics, right? I mean, you can look up where crime statistics happen. I mean, that's public data. And typically, suburban multifamily housing developments are no different than the areas around, them, right? They have, they might have more calls per square foot because there's more develop, there's more units. Right, per square foot than there are right next door. But if you look at per, by density, right, by, by number of units, there's no difference. I mean, that's like stamps. It's documented, right? Um, so first thing. Second thing, um, I, I think part of it is just, and I think new urbanism is actually doing a, a good job of it. Well, urbanism is maybe not so, <coughs> not so bad. There's like really nice things to be gotten from urbanism. And so having, uh, showing examples of places where that really works, right, is, is I think something that kind of needs to happen as part of the national dialogue. I, I've got a, a close friend of mine who's a developer in Phoenix um, and comes and visit us, visits us. Eugene loves the area that we live, which is just south of the university, which is a gridded, kind of typical, uh, you know, uh, street park suburbish type neighborhood, right? And we go and visit him in Phoenix, and he lives in this loops and lollipop thing, and you say, well, would you ever connect that? No, 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 you know, all the crime, people just come in and kill everyone. Right, and but yet he feels totally comfortable coming to visit me where I live, which is in theory a much more urban area than the area he lives, has all these connections, and yet there's like this kind of disconnect, right? And so I think like making people aware of these examples that exist that work really well, and again I think New Urbanism is doing for all of its problems, it's doing a really good job of that. It's kind of saying ah, urbanism can, is is not so bad, and then the other thing is just getting more examples of new developments that are happening. Right, so you know, like doing studies and you know, doing like some statistical studies of areas that are connected. What's that like? Talk to the residents, talk to the people who are there. And then the one last thing I say is convincing planners and developers, because it's really hard to convince residents once they live there. But when they move in, it's what they moved into, right? That's just that just just what exists. So it's important to convince people at the beginning and not try to convince people later on. We have we have we, have, we tend to like base a lot of our assumptions of what a place is on what we get, right? And so if you get it all closed off, someone says open, go. You get it all open, uh, that's what it is. What do you feel about the segregation that occurs between the demographics that primarily occupy the apartment blocks versus those that occupy single family housing? And do you have any thoughts at all about the integration of those two types of housing? It's a really good question. And so that's like um, an article I wrote a while back really talks about the idea that we're, while we're seeing a lot of, um, of diversity happening racially, economically, ethnically, um, as far as family type, yeah, um, the, the, it could be that we're actually seeing a spatially segregated differentiation. In other words, that mix looks really good up here, but if you look fine scale, and you've got everyone who's like single living here, all the families living out there, which is more or less what's happening. Um, and I, don't, I 
not sure I have a good answer for that. Uh, on, on the short term, I'm less interested in the question because I feel like there's a whole lot we can take advantage of with the mixing, mixing of authority there. Right? On the long term, it is more of a, I think of a, of a kind of social question uh, that kind of a, I think, I think like popular culture needs to catch up with. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer. Uh, yeah, so we did. Uh, we did so two methods. One was actual uh, interviews, and the other was surveys. So we sent out surveys to you know a, a, a subset of the people who live there, and just asked them a bunch of questions. Most of which were transportation related questions. How do you walk? How do you, we also asked them graph questions. We asked questions on um, on how uh, um, their biases. So what we want to know is if you're a tree hugger and you'd walk anyway. You know, does this are you just picking a place that's great to walk to? In the end, none of those things like seem to have met. The only thing that we found significance with, there were actually two things we found significance with. One was gender. So males seem to walk much more than women, um, and which we assumed was based mostly on uh, comfort and safety issues. You know, we didn't ask that question, so we don't know that. Um, and then the big one was how connected, and how like, and when we say connected, it's how amenable is the space for walking and biking. Right? If there are more ways of getting there, if it's protected, if it's like pleasant, that seems to be the biggest indicator. More than if you are like predisposed to really want to walk, a bike, or, or do anything, um, or or even if you own a car, or if you have access to a car. The biggest one was the the uh, the, the, the design project. Do you guys do any of the economics in the lab? Yeah. What you were proposing versus what's out there. And for a lot of the developers, maybe this needs to happen, whether they're pro forma pencils out or not. You know, and the infrastructure, if you're putting the top, top end of the market, you know, how is that compared to So it's a really good question, and we're absolutely uh, want to engage that. Uh, so, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question was, uh, did we have we looked at any of the economics? If we're really looking to kind of affect the way development happens, obviously we need to deal with developers. They're very interested in economics. Have we looked at any of this? In relation to uh, tuck under parking, parking site design, those things. Um, it's a really good question. It's something that we're absolutely conscious of. I think the, the hardest one is tuck under parking. Absolutely, that is that is a cost difference to do something like that. Uh, and in my mind, it's great to do that, but it's not the we don't have to do it, right? I think it's necessary but not sufficient, or, or it's beneficial but not necessary to do that. Kind of thing. The the issues I think that are big for economics are the amount of uh, all those connections that happen for all paid services, right? Which one, I don't know what concrete's doing right now, but concrete like two years ago was extremely expensive with all the construction that was going on in China, and that is a significant cost. So there, there is a question there, and so what, one of the things that we're doing as we do this uh, research is we're talking to uh, planning organizations and legislators. So what we'd like to do is say, if, this, if you have a benefit to this, if you can, and especially with what's happening right now at the federal level, which, you know, reduce carbon emissions, if we, can, if we can use this research to show if you make these connections, you have less driving trips, which reduces your carbon emissions, which reduces traffic, which saves us, the country, the state, the municipality money, all of a sudden you can make incentives to make these things happen. So we're absolutely looking at that piece of it. And then the simplest piece, which is simply making these connections, I mean, like all the walls I showed you between the commercial development, Making holes in those walls is no money at all. I mean, it's minimal money. It's really minimal money. Ordinances and uh, zoning issues and things like that, you know, fire truck, energy allowance, you know, like all of that stuff. Is that something that is going to be taken for you can or cannot be? So, yeah, so the question for those in Eugene, if there's anyone left over there, oh, there's people there, uh, was, uh, is, uh, how are we dealing with like zoning regulations, all kinds of regulations that kind of affect this piece? The zoning regulations are horrible for this type of housing. Uh, if you look, so I've looked at zoning codes from across the country, and typically what happens is the multifamily either fits strangely in commercial development because you make money off of it, is the argument that I've heard, which seems completely strange to me, or it's a modification of a single family home um, regulation. So in a single family home, what are you typically regulated? You're regulated by your side yard setback, your front yard setback, your height restriction, right? Those kinds of things. That really makes sense when you have a quarter acre lot. 
when your lot is 14 acres, to tell me that I need to be five feet in from the side yard doesn't tell me anything about what the development's going to be like. Right? And so what it pretty much is is largely unregulated. And so, so that's on one hand, right? In other words, there's, there's very little guidance and regulation to make better development happen, which I think is a problem. And then on the other side, there's all this regulation which actually uh, limits connections. So there, oftentimes there's code-mandated buffers between dissimilar uses. So if I have a commercial development and a residential development right next door, a lot of codes actually say I need to have at least a six-foot high, uh, uh, non-visibly non transparent barrier in between. <sighs> That's horrible. That's exactly the problem we're talking about, right? But it's based on that mentality of the enclave thing that I showed you, which is in suburbia, the way you stay safe is just don't bother your neighbors. And so this is really good zoning to not bother your neighbors. And so this multifamily housing handbook that we're doing, part of it, it has a model code in it. To be, so the idea is we're handing this out. Every municipality in, in Oregon is going to get it. The grant I have uh, requires me to do that, which I'm thrilled about. Uh, and then we're going to give it to every head of the DOT, Departments of Transit, around the country. And we're going to be uh, presenting it in a planning association meeting. And the idea is to get it in the hands of people who deal with zoning. <laughs> It'll have a model code in it. We'll say, these are what typically happens in codes. This is the way you should modify it. And then it'll also have a planning checklist, which will say, you planner, when you sit down to look at this thing, right? these are things you should look through and figure out, is this working? Is this not working? Because this is the effects it'll have at a larger scale. So we're absolutely, we're, we are 100% about getting this, changing the way that development happens. And so a lot of our research is absolutely focused on those things. I'm wondering, is there incentive for the retail to make those connections? I mean, they see the suburbia who drives in as being a bigger demographic or more important. So, so making connections. It's a, that that's a great question. And so the rea one reality is the car is not going to go away. And a commercial development, we can't go to mom and pop shops everywhere, right? In other words, the walking distance to, to a commercial strip mall is not going to be enough usually to support that strip mall. So we have to accept the cars are going to be, which I think is totally fine. Um, an interesting, so an interesting thing, in my mind, two things. One, that doesn't preclude that we can also make this an attractive pedestrian environment, right? Or that it can also foster a pedestrian environment, which again, for better or for worse, new urbanists have kind of showed that those can be economically feasible. Another thing that came out, which is completely interesting with the research that we did here, is that people who, um, People who only drive versus people who walk and drive, right, only walk. The people who walk and drive or only walk go to the commercial area more often than people who only drive. Does that make sense? That I don't know. I didn't ask that question. But so, so, this, so here's my mentality. Here's my reasoning for this, which I think is like absolutely, in, I'm, I'm dying to go give this at a, like a commercial developers convention and talk about this, is that, you know, let's go out for pizza. All right. The first decision is, am I going to drive or not? If I say that I'm not going to drive, then I'll go to the pizza shop that's right there. As soon as I get into my car, ah, the other one, like, which is like half a mile down the road, is much better. Half a mile in a car is nothing, so I'll go to the other one. Right? So all of a sudden, there's an incentive for commercial developers to say, let's make good connections and get people to really walk, because the more they walk, the more they're going to be captured by this area. And that, I, I have just that one bit of data from the, from the stuff that we did before, but I think there's if we can nail that and convince developers that commercial developers they'll be making more money by doing this, this will take care of itself. But I think I think it's the the I think it's there. I think it's just someone needs to study it. Good question. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. Studio important. Thank you.